Welcome to the NIHR Dementia Researcher podcast, brought to you by DementiaResearcher.nihr.ac.uk, in association with Alzheimer's Research UK and Alzheimer's Society, supporting early career dementia researchers across the world. Hello and welcome to the Methods Matter podcast from Dementia Researcher and the National Centre for Research Methods. In this series, we will be looking at five different research methods with a method expert and a dementia researcher that has experience of putting the method into practice. And today, we're keeping both feet on the floor, keeping it real and exploring grounded theory. I'm Donica Mullen. I'm a clinical research fellow at University of Edinburgh, and I'm delighted to be your host in the hot seat, asking the questions with my notepad ready. Helping me today in Expert Corner, we have resident guru, Dr. Karen Hughes, and in Research Ranch, we have teaching fellow and PhD candidate Nisha Danda from Aston University. Hello, and thanks for joining us. Hi. Hello. Hi. Bit hesitant there to get going, guys. But <laughs> <laughs> for those who don't know, Karen is an associate professor at University of Leeds, director of the Timescapes Archive, editor in chief of the BSA Sociological Research Online, and senior fellow of the National Centre for Research Methods. She also has an absolutely encyclopedic knowledge of qualitative research methods. Did I miss anything, Karen? No, you didn't. Um, and that was very flattering. Thank you, Donica. <laughs> okay. Nisha has a background in clinical audiology, and it is that work that led her to a PhD and an interest in the way people communicate and how this is affected by unmanaged hearing loss and associated comorbidities like cognitive impairment and dementia. Nisha, I see on uh, your bio form that you were a Shotokan Karate National Champion. I wonder, do you use that for street fighting? And if you do, is, is it true that before a fight you have to warn someone that your hands are deadly weapons? <laughs> <laughs> I wish. No, it, it's all about defence, not attack. <laughs> so, yeah, you're very safe with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was asked to do this one in person and I was too afraid, so I had to stick with Zoom for that reason. I actually know uh, a karate joke um, and I am a recent dad, so I think it falls into the dad category joke. Um, are you ready for the, for the bad joke? Please go ahead. Uh, why did the cupboard learn karate? Hmm, I don't know that one. For shelf defence. <laughs> Okay. You're very kind to laugh. Okay, that's enough bad jokes okay. for now. Let's get on with the show. Okay, so what do I know? We begin each podcast with me giving a summary of what I understand of the methods we're discussing, which of course today is grounded theory. So when I think of grounded theory, I think of Sherlock Holmes and how he would go from specific observed information to making conclusions about events that he didn't observe happen. So I guess he reasoned from specific things to more general things. Um, but I wasn't sure if I could base my entire uh, learning about grounded theory just on that. So I had a quick look on a very good resource um, called Wikipedia. It tells me that Grounded theory is a systematic methodology that has been largely applied to qualitative research methods conducted by social scientists. OK, that's easy to follow. Uh, let's move on. It, it then states the methodology involves the construction of hypotheses and theories through the collection and analysis of data. OK, that sounds pretty much like every methodology. Maybe the key is in the next part. Grounded theory involves the application of inductive reasoning. Karen, put me out of my misery and give me a proper introduction that I can understand. First of all, Donica, um, I went and had a look at Wikipedia too. Um, I do think that you have to be a bit of an expert in grounded theory to understand the Wikipedia entry. Um, so that that's the first thing. So, and I, I, we need to pedal back a little bit but, um, before we take a run at grounded theory, because when we're talking about grounded theory, we're taking parts in, in debates about the relationship between research and theory. So that was actually, that that provoked um, Barney Glazer and Ansel, Anselm Strauss um, to do the work that they did do. I'm going to come on to that in a, a minute. Um, so um, there were three sorts of approaches here. The first is where theory comes first and is then tested through data generation and analysis. The second, and this is where grounded theory falls in this area, is where research comes first, and then theory is developed on the basis of data generation 
and through analysis. And that's that inductive reasoning. That's that, right, so if this is the case, then this might be the case. Let's test that. Let's build explanation through our data. And the third is where theory, data generation and data analysis happen simultaneously in a sort of dialogic or reciprocal process. And it's worth um, having a look at Amanda Coffey and Paul Atkinson's book, um, Making Sense of Qualitative Data, um, because that, they, they, they elaborate on, on those three positions. So, um, in 1967, Glaser and Strauss published The Discovery of Grounded Theories, Strategies for Qualitative Research. Um, and in the book, um, they set out a case for systematically obtaining and analysing qualitative data in order to discover theories. So a lot of, you know, the, the hint is in, in the title, if you like. And they're really interesting because they're coming from two quite different positions. So on the one hand, they're addressing this tradition um, in social sciences that's been called symbolic interactionism. And, and that is looking at how humans, through our interactions, symbolically construct our social world. You know, that we, we make meaning um, in our everyday lives with each other. Um, you know, we're always engaged in this process of sense making. Um, so if we're symbolically constructing the social world. The implication there is that the social world doesn't just exist to be studied. You can't stand outside of it and simply observe. You have to engage with how and why people are making the meanings that they're doing. But on the other hand, um, they're really trying to push back on this idea that it's all subjective, you know, that we can only ever know our, our, our uh, you know, our own, our own values, that we can't build beyond those analytically. So their intention was to conduct systematic research, and they set out a whole, a whole set of um, guidelines around that, around coding data systematically and. Uh, and, and engaging in um, what they describe as con the constant comparative method, where, um, where um, it, it, as it implies, it's the constant comparison of all different dimensions of the case under observation. And they make this case as all the vagaries and differences need to be interrogated and accounted for, so that you're building from a very um, sort of substantialist, empirically focused um, set of ideas and theories to a formal theory. And that's, that's, that's part of this thing. Because, and grounded theory means it's grounded in the empirical, but it builds out um, in, in, in ways that allow those theories, even though they're focused on local events, can be generalizable to broader situations. And finally, the other thing is about grounded theory is that they focus on incidents rather than, um, you know, when people talk about lived experience, which is what you might think is implied in symbolic interactionism. Actually, that interaction is, a, say, is a set of incidents. And, and it's, it, that, that's where their sort of focus is, um, is, is aimed at. Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much for that awesome introduction. Um, you, you mentioned the year 1967 there. One of the questions I had, for me, I had this idea that grounded theory was quite a new method. Would you say that in comparison to other qualitative methods that it is a, a fairly new method? No, I, I, I think that it builds out of quite a long tradition. And if we're going to get really theoretical, it builds out of Kant, actually, Immanuel Kant. Um, it's taken up in the work of Husserl and his uh, phenomenology, where um, it's it's trying to 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 get to this idea. Um, Husserl talks about bracketing off, so looking at, at distinctive situations in which what we're able to observe, uh, you know, how meaning is in is formed through which processes and in, in which ways. And so, what in a sense, although it sounds hugely objective. By rendering it as a form of phenomenon, so phenomenology, that we're that we're able to um, interrogate in particular ways and build up systematic explanations. So it's got this very very long, um, long tradition, uh, 
um, in the introduction of their book, they talk about, um, is it, is, Nisha, you can help me out here. Is it Strauss comes from Columbia and um, Glazer comes from Chicago School or is it the other way around? I can't remember. One I, of them, I think you've got it, it the, the right way around. Have I got it the, got right it the right way around? Right. So one comes from a very positivist tradition. One comes from a very interpretivist tradition if we were using, you know, easy, easy sorts of terms, you know, to make sense of where they're coming from. And I think what they're trying to do is they're trying to move qualitative research beyond this idea that it's it's Casey Fireside chats and that's all that qualitative data can be treated as. It's just these very locally situated, descriptive forms of engagement with only local application. That's and so it's reflective of that time, but it has this tremendously long um, antecedents um, in, in philosophical tradition, actually as well. So I think why it might feel new is that it's been taken up um, repeatedly in different traditions. So critical realism, constructivism, um, various other traditions where it, it's been uh, re, uh, reframed or reorientated. Um, so as any, as any methodology, it, it has its own history. Um, and and that history is never ending. It's always changing. Brilliant. Thank you for putting me straight there. It sounds like a wonderful approach. Um, I love the, the kind of empirical basis of it. And what what are the particular situations or areas that you find lend itself to this methodology? Well, I, and I'm going to move a little bit away from grounded theory in the sense I'm going to talk about, inter and I can't ever pronounce this, and all my students throughout the decades know that I can't do this. It's in interpretive phenomenological analysis and IPA. OK, that's where we're going to go with that one. Um, so it's it's that's often been used in health sciences research. And it's where what we're trying to do is to find out what's going on in situations where we have no knowledge. So grounded theory approaches or those approaches which seek to work from the particular to the general um, without um, relying on previous theory in that area is, is it's a really sort of suitable set of questions and approaches um, for those research settings where things are quite new. And they might be new, say, through, through diagnoses, through new social situations. Um, so it's, it's quite an investigative approach. Who was it? Was it Donald Rumsfeld who talked about known unknowns and unknown unknowns? <laughs> Something confusing <laughs> like that. It sounds like it'd be good for the unknown unknowns. <laughs> yes. So that comes okay. out of the Jahari window as well in psychology. Okay. Things okay. that we can know about ourselves, other yeah. knows about us and so on and so forth. But there's always something that other people might not know that we might not know that and that's an area of investigation. <laughs> the unknown Brilliant. unknowns. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now this might be a hard question to answer, but is this a hard method to use? Uh yeah. I, I think well, I think it is and it isn't. I think so the basic questions that you ask in grounded theory, you know, like what's going on and why? <laughs> I think that that's at the heart of all, all social and human centred research, well, any research, what the hell is going on? So there's some lovely uh, questions in grounded theory that I think really distill the essence of the most general sort of research endeavour. But I think to conduct grounded theory and make a claim that it's grounded theory, um, to move from a substantialist or local set of theories and findings to generating a formal theory, that entire process is hugely time consuming. It's very exhaustive. Um, and I think it's enormously challenging because I think you need to, if you like, stick with the program. And, and that's very, very demanding. OK, so words like exhaustive, challenging, demanding. Nisha, I think that brings us nicely on to your experience of using it. Um, I know you're coming to the end of your PhD, so you might want to give away all the details, save some nice surprises for the thesis committee. But can you tell me about your research? What have you discovered? Of course, yes. So, um, so what I'm really interested in is um, 
the mechanisms behind hearing loss and dementia um, in older adults and um, what we what we know is that social isolation and social withdrawal has some part to play in that association uh, but i want to uh, i'm interested in how and why it's maintained in residential care settings so um i conducted my sort of grounded theory research in two residential care homes and um used ethnography and interviews um, of residents themselves, of relatives um, and of care staff uh, to really try to understand what the, the mechanisms were um, uh, in in the communication style within these residential care homes. Um, is it really down to having a hearing loss and impaired um, communication through uh, your your dementia severity that means that you are isolated and you withdraw? Or is it because there are people who are unwilling to have, um, you know, social connectedness and social interactions with you? And actually, that's what reinforces um, your, your withdrawal and, and your isolation. And it was fascinating, actually, trying, um, you know, the Tr trying to form a theory um, from from the research and and trying to go in very open minded, you know, without uh, without sort of um, uh, without preempting what what it is that I think is contributing to to these mechanisms. Um, and, I, and and what I found was actually that your the amount of hearing loss that you have has very little to do with how isolated you feel. Um, and, you know, sticking hearing aids on everybody is not the solution in residential care homes, because actually the environment itself needs to be adapted and adjusted for the residents rather than the residents having to stick devices on themselves to adjust. Um, what I also found was that people with um, in, in a sort of moderate or severe stage of dementia who may be experiencing in, um, disordered language and impaired communication, in the right setting, they are still able to have a very thorough and meaningful conversation and connection with somebody. But all it takes is a bit of time and space to get there and for somebody to be able to read between the lines of what they're saying and follow their track. Um, and actually, because of the way that a, a residential um, a care home generally is set up, there isn't the time or space to do that. And, and it isn't the fault of the staff, you know, because they are part of a wider political system that doesn't allow them to, to do that. Um, and it, it, but, but what it shows is actually there are some really um, cheap and quick solutions that I won't go to, into too much here, but there are some quick, cheap and quick solutions that we can implement into residential care homes to improve communication for, for older adults. I'm really keen to know what they are. So we, we, we can have a minute on it. What, what would your top couple of solutions be? Yeah, couple of solutions. I mean, so adjusting the communal spaces so if we think that actually residential care uh, residents they spend maybe up to 10 hours of their day in the communal areas of the of the home if we can adjust the way that the furniture is placed if we can avoid having a tv radio and an alexa on at the same time um, if we can have maybe softer furnishings if we can try to adjust where the natural light is coming from people may be more ready to adapt uh, more ready to communicate with one another um, if we um, have you know, um, somebody like a hearing therapist come in once a week uh, to, to the home to spend some time with residents and allow staff to learn about the sort of mechanisms of effective communication, they may be able to implement these things in their daily conversations with residents and that could help. 
then, you know, could we introduce a very small, quiet space within these communal areas that actually maybe one or two residents could go off and, and, and talk with one another? Because what what it, it's not actually about the quantity of friends that you have in this place. It's about the quality of social connections that you have with people. And that might only be one or two people, but it, it's really important to foster those relationships. They all sound like cheap and very sensible and very effective methods. And I wish that, I hope people are listening. I hope people are listening to those. Um, I know from clinical experience um, that sometimes we we think uh, someone with who's living with dementia is agitated or being aggressive, but actually it might be a communication breakdown. Um, you mentioned earlier that it's not all just about putting in hearing aids, um, but more of these solutions that you've just mentioned. Do you, do you think that uh, that hearing loss is a contribution to what's perceived as agitation or aggression? Completely, because, you know, I always used to say this to my patients that actually what you, you, you are not experiencing a hearing loss, you're experiencing a communication loss. And it's not just you, it's actually everybody around you who you want to communicate with successfully, they are involved in this journey with you. So when, when you're unable to express yourself as clearly as you want to, and when you... um when you ha have a feeling that you're not being received as well as you want to be, that can cause a huge amount of agitation. And I think that the there's so many, there's such an overlap in symptoms between um, unmanaged hearing loss and perhaps the early and moderate stages of dementia that the two get very confused uh, very quickly. Um, and, and adding to that, because of sort of recent um, research in the last 10 years about this possible uh, causal effect of hearing loss leading to dementia, the natural, um, I suppose, solution that there were some commercial providers think is that, you know, if you, if you stick a hearing aid on someone early enough, then you're delaying the onset of dementia because now suddenly they're able to communicate. But actually what we know is that the processing involved in listening through a hearing aid can be very, very overwhelming for some people, not for all. And it really is a, um, I, I hesitate to say solution, but it is a management option for some people, but for others it isn't. So if we can actually provide communication strategies and find ways to adjust the environment, that's much more effective. Brilliant. It sounds like this method has really worked for you and the findings you have. What, what spurred you on to use this method in the first place? What was your thought process around that? Yeah, it, it was um, great to be introduced to it really early on in, um, in my PhD from my uh, primary supervisor who had used this method in a similar setting. Um, and, and when she asked me to go and read up about it and, and, and you know, see how I felt about using it, it all just seemed to really fit into place because we I didn't know exactly what the answers were to this to this problem I knew it was a huge problem and I knew that from my clinical experience but actually to really try to understand the lived experience I felt that this method you know it sat very well here um, and it was a way of using localized context potentially for for wider good if it was done properly um and and that's why i i i felt really comfortable learning more about it and um and then you know trying to take the bold step to to actually implement it okay brilliant well good on you making that step we we now have a good description of what the method is and an example of how it has been used let's get into the detail and provide some top tips for anyone who, who is new to using the method in this segment i'm going to ask some quick straightforward questions to both guests on how to put the method into practice karen the first questions are for you when is it best to use this method um, so I've already said it's really useful when um, to use grounded theory in situations where nothing yet is known or, or that um, there's only very tenuous knowledge in the area. But it might also be a really good method to use where 
previous theorizations have been hugely problematic. So maybe they've been like racist or sexist or ableist or, or, or whatever. Um, I think there's also a politics of method. Uh, so it may well be that there are certain fields, disciplinary fields, uh, where people are more likely to be persuaded by grounded theory than by other qualitative approaches. So it may well be um, that people will choose to use grounded theory as a sort of more of a po political strategy because um, they can begin to talk about sy systematization, valid internal validity, generalizability. Um, they can present codes. They can demonstrate the relationship between hypotheses and theories in, in a sort of almost like a to an extent in some form, of, maybe not a linear line, but certainly a, a, a sort of a zigzagging line towards towards a set of ex explanations. And it might be, for example, in health sciences research, that um, grounded theory um, uses a language that is uh, persuasive to other people, um, say, coming from a much more um, STEM, say, a STEM background. It's working on me. How does someone prepare to use grounded theory and, and could I use quantitative data in it? Absolutely. I mean, this is one of the things about grounded theory is that, um, I mean, for me, I, I, I think that this sort of thing around as if there's an antipathy between qualitative and quantitative data is problematic. It's not. It's around how we treat different data as particular forms of evidence in order to build particular sorts of explanations. And we have to be very clear about how some data support certain explanations and how other data support different explanations. And that's the that's the fundamental challenge for a researcher. Um, so um, in terms of um, building, you know, um, particularly in terms of the incidences aspect in a lot of big um, uh, data-driven social sciences research that that's what's being identified through um, uh, big big data analytics are incidences, unexpected incidences, you know, um, coalescing um, a, a, a sorts of phenomena in data that need then explanation. So absolutely, quant data can be used. Um, I'll just finish really quickly. Um, so it, how do people prepare to use it? Um, they have to decide which um, which approach to grounded theory they're going to take and, and why. And they also need to understand the extent and scope of grounded theory that is possible. Because as I said, it's really exhaustive, it's challenging, there's a procedure, uh, it's, it's very time consuming. Keeping what you've said about grounded theory in mind, things like it's difficult, it's not easy, it's it's time consuming. Would you recommend that this is more used by experienced researchers or do you think anyone could use this research method? I think anyone can use it. And again, it's coming back to this. I, I always use this language of horses for courses. It's like, you know, uh, uh, um, what is it that you're trying to achieve in your research? So what is your question um, and how how are you going to how are you proposing to answer it? And your question absolutely defines and determines what it is that you need to do in order to answer it. Um, so uh, and a lot of PhDs are uh, a form of pursuit, um, a search for the question as well. So it's a recursive process, quite challenging. Um, but grounded theory, as I said, it's at the core of it. It's it, it really has a set of questions, which is what on earth is going on? How do I make sense of this? Um, how do I build a persuasive um, argument? So I think the challenges of grounded theory apply um, more generally. But again, it's like, who is this for? And what sort of evidence base am I trying to build? And, and that also determines the sort of extent to which, um, or the extent of, of the research study um, that you're gonna use grounded theory. And, and to be honest, I should imagine that Nisha is much better placed to answer that question than, than I am. And I think you have, a, 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 I'd like to have her input on the next question as well. But I would like to know from, from your experience, Karen, and seeing PhD students using it, that um, we know that for a lot of people, their PhD, the question isn't perfectly clear at the start. So it'll take time to get to that. 
And given that it, that the, the theory or the method you should use should be based on your question, really. Um, if someone comes up to you with a question, say, a year into their PhD and you think, oh, grounded theory would work for that, but you've got funding for two more years, would you ever say maybe keep that question for a postdoc and uh, try a different approach? Or So I would never dissuade people from using um, a methodology. I do think that people, um, methods aren't tools. I think that's the other thing. And I think that's one of the, for me, one of the challenges of grounded theory that it seems to suggest, particularly as Glazer and Strauss set it out, is, is that it is. Um, um, and I much prefer the work of um, Kathy um, Chalmers, who uses constructivist grounded theory. She, she does some lovely stuff um, and shows it as it a much more adaptable sort of set of strategies rather than this very formalised um, set of procedures. So for me, um, in order to understand which methodologies are suitable for a particular research question, that process of reflection is often seen in research to be solely methodological. However, and this is another challenge to grounded theory, or a, compl a, a complication of it, is that through interrogating that very question, which method should I use with these people in this situation, in this way, we are always drawing on additional forms of evidence. We are always building theory around that. And that process of questioning is an in and of itself a process of empirical inquiry, which is inevitably theoretically driven. So for me, this, this second challenge of grounded theory is not have I got enough time to use it because it's a set of strategies really um, and should be adaptable to those circumstances. But for me, there's this second challenge, which is, is it actually possible to be a theoretical? And given that as human beings, we are constantly theorising about our lives, that our participants when we're speaking to them, are presenting to us sets of theories that draw on bigger theoretical traditions through our shared social history, that there is a challenge for grounded theory in that to take account of how we are all always theoretically driven. So again, it's like, what, what does my student want to do and what claims do they want to make about their research and what the challenges to that might be? And the final question for you, Karen, you, you mentioned there that grounded theory is a sort of set of strategies. And how would you decide which of these strategies you want to use? Again, it's like, which is suitable? Because, and I think Nisha, again, is a much better place to, to discuss this in terms of her research, which ones she used and which ones she sort of edited out because they simply weren't appropriate for, for the situation. I mean, the other thing is, like, this is this is what I always find so problematic, is as if somehow in human-centred research we're shipping in these strategies that exist outside of humans, and if we put them, we use these strategies in the right way, we can somehow generate extra human knowledge, so this sort of like free-floating truth around uh, an explanation around what it is that's going on or what it is that we're doing. Whereas in actual fact, particularly in qualitative research, our methods reflect what it is to be human. So grounded theory in and of itself is a process of inquiry. It's asking, what, what do you think? What's happening? How did you make sense of this? What does this mean to you over perhaps a period of time th through different situations with different people? And that, that is what we do always anyway in, in, in making sense of ourselves and making sense of the world around us. Brilliant. So Nisha, I'm going to move over to, to, to questioning you and I have a few extra bonus questions carried over because I think, yeah, we all agreed that you're well placed to answer them. Yeah. So if it's OK with you, I'll, I'll start with those ones carried over. So I guess the first one was around how long it takes to, to use this method and would you recommend uh, it for someone doing a PhD? Yes, I mean, I, I, I suppose I should state that I am doing a part time uh, PhD. Um, so, I mean, I did have two kids in between, but you know, it there there is a. I I suppose I had I had the the time 
uh, to really think about in those in those first two years, you know, to think about how I was going to execute the method, um, you know, and build building relationships with the care homes in which I conducted the research was a really big element, actually, I think, of making the research successful. Um, because, you know, residential care homes, they are a social construct within themselves um you know and when you when you enter as a stranger it can be a, it can be very daunting so i did a lot of um participant engagement work uh, patient and public involvement work very early on in my PhD, not only with those two care homes, but with two other care homes to really understand the uh, the culture of a care home. And I think that uh, by doing so and by, uh, you know, by, by making myself a familiar base within those settings, that really helped me to feel comfortable in doing the observations and doing the interviews. Um, I think somebody doing a full time, you know, traditional three to four year PhD certainly could do this method um, and do it very well. But it's just about being, you know, it's about being planned. And, you know, from from that those first few months that you start your PhD, it's about knowing straight away, OK, well, this is where I would like to conduct my research. So let's do all of the preparation to put that into place, uh, because there's no way that you can just turn up. Um, at, you know, especially a setting like a residential care home and say, oh, you know, is it OK if I spend time with you for a month um, without doing any of that planning? Yeah. The other question was, which uh, strategies from the grounded theory sort of toolkit did, did you decide to, to use and how did you decide to use them? Yeah, so I, I decided to steer away from the traditional um, grounded theory uh, uh, methods or strategies because I had to be very um, open and conscious about the fact that my clinical background and my clinical career meant that actually I do have some preconceptions about um, this area of inquiry. Um, you know, I do have a, a, a an understanding, not the understanding, but one point of view of what it is like to communicate for somebody with um, hearing loss um, and, you know, learning then about uh, people living with dementia and, and, and w what that experience is like has, has, has been fascinating to me. But what I try to to move to much more of a, a practical grounded theory method like the constructivist um, one that Karin mentioned, um, where actually I try to um, use the, the context in which I was in to help really form uh, the theory and, and, and apply it to that particular context. Um, I also have done a lot of reading about um, realist research and sort of um, how the the context um, and mechanisms of, of of a particular phenomenon will will affect the outcomes um, and whilst I'm not claiming that I've done realist research at all I think that really having a focus on on my context and, and where the research was placed has helped me to form the grounded theory mechanisms uh, because like I said I was um, d conducting my research in two different care homes and those two different care homes have come out with different findings because of the localized context. Okay okay and, and this may be my newness to this area but did your use of the constructivist approach, did that necessarily mean that your preconceived ideas and your, your experience and your clinical experience, which is all really valuable, did using that approach over others mean that that, that kind of took care of that as an issue? It was no longer a big problem in, in the research. I wouldn't say it took care of it because I think that we still have to be very reflective as researchers of how actually those preconceptions can really bias our um, 
uh, our forming of theories um you know the data is is the data um but actually you know perhaps the way that i have viewed an observation or the way that i have coded certain interview transcripts may be biased because of um my my background and you know my my supervisor is is and and at the time was so wonderful in allowing me to debrief after an an observation or debrief after a set of interviews so that I could almost you know um, vent all of these biases and then they were out there and so actually whilst they have been um, acknowledged within the the analysis I, I hopefully they I've also tried to to take away some of the bias as well by acknowledging it. So I think that's really interesting what um, Nisha is saying. Um, and Jennifer Mason uses the language of reflexive epistemology. So it's a process of working through what it is that we're thinking, how we're doing that, when it's not just a simple, well, what am I thinking? But actually it's, it's theory building um, and theory testing simultaneously. Brilliant, thanks for that, Karen. And then Nisha, a question I had, was how did you stay on track? Or I guess, did you stay on track during this? And if so, how, how did you manage to stay on track while using this method? I suppose, you know, doing the method because of the, the setting in which I was, you know, in, in within the residential care homes, I was very conscious of their time and and you know me sort of um, imposing on on their time and space so I think that uh, uh, that knowledge really did keep me on track I knew that you know I, I did not want to outstay my welcome and so I needed to try to conduct my research within a set amount of time um, and I I was very planned from the beginning and, and knew that I would be there for x amount of hours over x amount of days um, and that really uh you know, help me to to ensure that actually it was it was all done um, within within that time frame. Um, and I, I should add that I completed my last set of observations and interviews two days before the first lockdown. So, uh, you know, thank goodness that I, I had to book that in. Um, but yeah, it's it's very easy to be to get off track if you don't you know meticulously meticulously plan when you're going to do these observations and interviews okay so you mentioned a few useful skills there are there other skills that you think someone should work on developing if they wanted to use this uh, research method i think being really open minded is 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 important you know and and whilst it's great to acknowledge any preconceptions or acknowledge any biases that you may have, being very open-minded to what you are observing and hearing and, um, and, and then asking somebody to take a second look at your analysis is, is very helpful to have a discussion, um, you know, about the way that they interpret things compared to the way that you do, um, and then being open minded to those differences in interpretation. Well, it's been brilliant. And um, I get the impression this method is a little tricky to use if you want to stay true to the book, but get it right and the benefits are clear. So, let me recap on what I've learned so far. Grounded theory has multiple traditions uh, from theory to data analysis, but also the reverse of that. So from research and data to theory are a simultaneous reciprocal method. A second learning point for me is that grounded theory has a long tradition and builds on work from philosophers such as Kant. A really interesting point for me was that IPA is not just an uh, Indian pale ale, but it's also an approach that is suitable to use where we have no knowledge on a subject. And a point that came out time and time again is that grounded theory is a challenging, demanding, uh, can be exhausting, a time consuming uh, method. But that if you remain with an open mind and keep your preconceived ideas under check, stay focused and, and keep to a time plan that you will get some excellent results by the end of it, as demonstrated by Nisha and her findings from her PhD. So in this final part of the show, we're going to discuss common pitfalls, challenges, and how to avoid them. 
Nisha, tell us what challenges you came across in delivering your research and what might you do differently? Uh, what have you learned along the way? Yeah, I suppose the the biggest challenge initially was trying to form really meaningful relationships with in these residential care homes um you know as i touched on earlier they are um they they have their own sort of culture um as soon as you enter the 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 door and um trying to be a part of that can can be difficult but i i found you know by sort of trying to stay out of the way as much as I could and trying not to impose on, on the residents and um, care staff's usual routines, that really helped. Um, and being really honest and transparent about why I was there, um, you know, that I, I, I was not some official body observing what they do and, and how they work, but actually I was really interested in them as, as people. Um, and I suppose another uh, challenge was knowing really when to stop. You know, like I said, I, I did already have this set amount of time that I was going to be um, in the settings for. Um, but I was nervous to as to how much data I would get through and collect in that time and whether that was going to be enough and, and meaningful um, for me to form the, the theories and, and really understand the mechanisms. Um, so. I suppose uh, what I've learned along the way is, you know, people connect with people. So if, if, if you can be really honest and transparent and upfront about what it is that you want to achieve, then people are there to, to help you do so. Um, and just don't stop reading, even when you're collecting data. Just keep on reading to check that you are on the right track with the with the methodology that you've chosen. Um, but then, you know, have the confidence to say, well, no, actually, I, I feel like I've, I have con um, collected enough here. OK, that's something I can share, that, that thought around collecting. When have I collected enough data? C Karen, what are the common pitfalls and how do you avoid them? So for me, I think there's... A really big challenge with grounded theory with this idea of being a theoretical because i just don't think that that you know as i said earlier i don't think that's feasible um because we are into who we are where we are how we understand the world from what sorts of perspective builds out very much longer historical traditions so for me there's a real concern with grounded theory which is that it sort of is pushing towards what I would describe drawing on the work of Norbert Elias as a retreat to the present, that it's atemporal, that this idea of, of bracketing, of um, bracketing off, of treating things, human situations and incidences as, as phenomena um, has the problem, even when, like Nisha's research is absolutely about what is this human, of the human experience, you know, there, there could be a real push towards trying to exclude all of that. And so I think that that's an, a, 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 a real challenge and a contradiction in the sort of philosophical underpinnings of the methodological approach itself. So that's that's one of the biggest pitfalls for me. Um, there's this other thing which in, in grounded theory, which is this idea that, that builds out the constant comparative method. And Nisha said knowing when to stop. So um, in its original formulation, the grounded theory um, proposes that you keep on in order to build from a very local particular or substantialist theory to this big formal theory that you've got to keep on on sort of testing and exploring and interrogating through different forms of comparison in order to understand um, all of the ins and outs, the vagaries and diversities of situations so that your your explanation um, can, account, can account for those. And the language that they used was the language of saturation. So one of the things that they said is that when you're researching in a situation, so we're still focused on this substantialist area, mental health or dementia and hearing loss or, or whatever, that when people stop saying something different, i.e. that you've reached the extent of diversity and vagary and difference um, uh, uh, in, in, that, um, in that setting, that you've you've in effect reached saturation point, and at that point, that so in a sense, that's telling you that's when you stop with the data gathering. You you can feel quite confident that you've captured all the diversity of that setting. But for me, obviously, I'm somebody who um, 
does a lot on methods of qualitative secondary analysis, looking at how data can be endlessly and creatively reused, that the same interview can inform in a billion different ways <laughs> on the social world, depending on when it's analysed and for which reasons and by whom and so on and so forth. So that very language of saturation, I think, can be quite problematic, again, more broadly, epistemologically. So for me, I think that researchers claiming to use that language or wanting to use that language should really treat it with a little bit of, of, of caution. Um, and, and, and as Nisha has done, is that well, what's fit for purpose? What was it that I needed to know in order to be able to answer my questions and generate findings that are useful in, in, this, in this particular context and speaks to the needs both of participants and also of the service providers. So perhaps thinking a little bit more pragmatically in that way gets us away from a very problematic notion of, of saturation. Brilliant. In this final segment, I'm going to give our expert, Karen, one minute to tell our listeners what they should go away and read to further their knowledge on this method. OK, obviously, Glazer and Strauss, they, they wrote a number of books together, but then also Corbin and Strauss, because there was a bit of a rift between the original pairing. And it's worth following that through if you want to see how grounded theory is developed. Kathy Chalmers developed um, constructivist grounded theory and her website uh, that she had. And there's lots of other online resources had. To they were fantastic resources um, and there's like an hour long interview with her um, speak, talking about um, constructivist grounded theory on YouTube that's well worth um, going and having a look at it was conducted as part of a, a, a conference at Huddersfield University um, uh, for methods and techniques of analysis I actually think that it's worth going and having a look at Virginia Braun and Victoria Clark's website, which is called thematicanalysis.net. Um, this website is absolutely rammed with resources on thematic analysis, and they critically engage with the language of ground to theory. So, for example, you know, they, they're very critical of the idea that something uh, meanings emerge from data. But Actually, they deal with the problematics by providing some really helpful guidance on how you might go a, a, about those sorts of analyses. Thank you so much. I'm afraid uh, that's all we have time for today. So let me say a huge thank you to our wonderful guests, the incredible Dr. Karen Hughes and the brilliant Nisha Danda. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. With the show notes, you'll find links to all the resources mentioned by our guests. So please join us next time on the Methods Matter podcast from Dementia Researcher and the National Institute for Research Methods. Brought to you by DementiaResearcher.nihr.ac.uk in association with Alzheimer's Research UK and Alzheimer's Society, supporting early career dementia researchers across the world.